Welcome back to New Rock Stars. I'm Eric Boss, and I am still trying to unpack Loki Season 2, one of the greatest arcs of Marvel Studios storytelling yet. And even after breaking down this season exhaustively, episode by episode, even more details have emerged so that I can't leave this season without breaking down for you guys. Everything from details hidden in the actors' costumes in plain sight, to what was really said about Kang in that TVA paperwork, to even some X-Men details that were confirmed by the producers. So here we go, uh, around 14 more details that we missed in Loki Season 2. Detail number one, the latest new detail was shared by Kihuei Kwan in his Instagram. In episode three, in the early scene on the Loom Observation deck, you may have noticed that OB for this scene only wears this weird orange utility belt. Kihuei Kwan revealed that this was called his data utility belt by the prop designers and that this thing opens up to contain a whole bunch of gadgets and gizmos. It was a nod to his character Data in The Goonies, a classic that I broke down on the Deep Dive channel this past summer. Data was a huge fan of James Bond and had a 007 marked utility belt that he would use to shoot stuff out. In this detail, along with the appearance of a short round New York Giants baseball cap from Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom in A.D. Doug's workshop in episode five, just made this whole season a love letter to Kihuei Kwan's career. Next, many are asking what happened to Hunter X5, AKA Brad Wolf, whom this series never really picks up with in the epilogue. But there is, if you look closely, a little cameo by Brad on Mobius's desk in the final episode on the cover of that Jet Ski magazine. Brad Wolf's actor headshot and his name are on the cover of it. So presumably our man got to live out his life as an actor in the sacred timeline. Okay, tease number three. Since we are at this desk, let's talk about that TVA risk report threat identification form that we had been trying to make out, describing the events of Ant-Man the Wasp Quantumania. Another shout out to Adam Burns for working so hard to make this out with the help of many across social media. Here is the latest that we can decipher. Variant K8910, name, I want to say unknown, and then alias Kang the Conqueror, branch 8911-231009, temporal aura, Kang, variants, powers, not identified, and then species Terran. And I like how they consider uh, anything from Earth to be Terran. Like they won't say human, they'll say Terran. Maybe that's like a specific category of human. And then related case files, and it looks like uh, 12 or so cases. Okay, then down in event summary, you can make out the words illegal apprehended use of energy something with positively identified Kang tech whereabouts of suspect unknown. And then beneath that, aura analysts. And then beneath that, investigation known evidence. And then in the lower paragraph, just bits and pieces here, controlled due to the, and then infested power. And then Scott Lang, Ant-Man in quotes, identified, then variant K8910, leading military involvement, threat was neutralized. Okay, so from this, we can gather that the TVA categorizes Kang the Conqueror from Quantumania as K8910. There is an Earth 8910 in Marvel Comics from an Excalibur run in the year 1989. For what it's worth, 1089, October 1989, was a big month. That was the month that we saw covers of Quasar's premiere issue in the Marvel's film just confirmed that the Bengals were Quasar's quantum bands, so maybe there is something there. And that month was the first time we saw Peter Parker's black symbiote suit following the events of the 80s Secret War in what if number four. Okay, detail number four. One odd detail about Mobius in this case file scene in the final episode, look at the background as B-15 walks through the Chrono Monitor Bay to first talk to OB and Casey. Owen Wilson is completely frozen with his mug up near his face. It's actually kind of creepy. Like maybe what he's reading about Kang the Conqueror is freaking him out this much or that somehow that Kang the Conqueror is still able to freeze people in time. The case file did report, quote, whereabouts of suspect unknown. So that Kang the Conqueror is not dead. Okay, detail number five, Sylvie's McDonald's uniform, first shown in episode two, is like everything in this McDonald's 100% period accurate. The production designers worked with McDonald's Corporation to get 1982 specific versions of everything, including the menu, including that creepy apple tree. And that includes Sylvie's name badge, which has her name, Sylvie, and then these five little stars. These are real life employee merit stars that are given to McDonald's employees. From left to right, these stars are for cleanliness, teamwork, grill, fries, and good personality. Okay, detail number six. Loki's costume throughout the series, according to the costume designer, Chris Christine Wada in a behind the scenes video that was released on Marvel's YouTube channel said that all of Loki's suits in season two are designed to have curved edges to represent the way time, according to the TBA, is curved. I know, it kind of sounds like some nonsense you guys say that I'm reaching on in videos, but the designer herself said that this was intentional. There's sort of no squares or rectangles. Everything curves, just like time curves. Okay, detail number seven. For Loki's final God of Stories wardrobe, Christine Wada wanted it to look like, quote, remnants of shattered armor, but not like real armor, but more like a softer, more humble suggestion of armor. So she used pleating to create folds in such a way that the cloth was layered the way armor kind of is. And again, all of it is curved to reflect the curved timelines. She also singled out his simple loafers, which she designed as a statement for his more peaceful 
peaceful destination on a throne. Anybody can pick up an action figure to put on their shelf, but building a model shows the world how devoted of a fan you really are. And if you're a devoted Robocop fan, Fan Home has a model kit for you. Fan Home is a brand dedicated to developing unique collections and build up models from Universal, Star Wars, Marvel, and more. A Fan Home subscription gets you magazines loaded with trivia and stories about your favorite fandom, but also everything you need to build your very own Robocop. Fan Home's Robocop model stands just over two feet tall when it's completed and has tons of awesome details like a working thigh holster, silicone modeled facial features, and sound effects from the movie. Plus, the body is made from metal and ABS plastic, so it's sturdy and easy to show off. With a Fan Home subscription, you get new parts every month, plus instructions on how to put everything together so you can build your model up bit by bit rather than be overwhelmed trying to do it all at once. On top of that, you'll get a Robocop t-shirt, hat, binder, posters, and a battery pack. A Fan Home subscription is the perfect way to make your collection stand out. To get started, just click the link in the description below. Detail number eight, as I pointed out in the breakdown, Loki's reimagined horns are made from the same Kitsugi obsidian from the Citadel, but their long pronounced silhouette may remind you of Thor's back tattoo in Thor Love and Thunder, in which he had tattooed R.I.P. Loki. And since Loki is now the god of stories, and yes, co-director Aaron Moorhead himself used this term in interviews, so I'm not just making that up, Loki as a rightful god should have a seat in that omnipotent city chamber among the other gods, or at least have a kind of representative there at that council. Just interesting to read how the directors clarify that they don't consider Loki a god of time, but rather the god of everyone's story. And he's the librarian that protects it and allows it to flourish. Okay, detail number nine. Also just really cool the way this episode, this season, and all the MCU really foreshadowed this destination for Loki, and it all leads in one linear path, or one curved path, but it did seem like a destined faded end for him. During the Groundhog Day sequence, when Loki activates the Loom Room, the automated voice says, Welcome, he who remains. Now it is a programmed response assuming that Victor Timely is the one logging in, but it also represents Loki is destined to become his own version of he who remains. Detail number 10. Furthermore, it's Loki's destination of a throne that has been part of his journey since the beginning. In the 2011 Thor movie, Odin said, Only one of you can ascend to the throne, but both of you were born to be kings. And in the 2012 Avengers film, Tony Stark says, You're missing the point. There's no throne. There is no version of this where you come out on top. And Tom Hiddleston to prepare watched all of these scenes, his entire catalog of Loki arcs in the MCU. And reportedly it was his idea to say this line. I know what kind of God I need to be for you, for all of us. Because it was a callback to his line in the very first Thor film. I could have done it, father. I could have done it for you, for all of us. No, Loki. Okay, detail number 11, let's talk about Ren Slayer. She ends this series in the void and head writer Eric Martin told Esquire that, quote, some fun inferences can be drawn from the pyramid that is behind Ren Slayer in the void background. Maybe Eric Martin is suggesting Ravona could have a future with Pharaoh Ramatut. Ramatut was one of the earliest incarnations of the character, later retconned to be Kang, all the way back in Fantastic Four number 19 in 1963. But the big detail comes in Disney Plus's closed captioning for this moment that Eliath creeps up on her, where the sound effect description that they use is written thusly, metal creaking. We see that on screen in the closed captioning. What metal creaking are we hearing for this smoke creature? Could it be the metal TVA emblem as a potential hatch opening to save Renslayer from Eliath? Or is Eliath a type of machinery? We know Kate Heron and Michael Waldron in season one based Eliath's look and design partly on the smoke monster from Lost. And to create the smoke monster, the effects team on Lost combines sounds from a number of sources, including heavy machinery clanking. Eric Martin ponders, does Eliath kill her or did they strike up a friendship. Maybe Eliath remembers her. I don't know. I think he remains needed Renslayer to help him tame Eliath, and I think she could be a future deadly force in an alliance with this beast. Okay, detail number 12. Quick detail that I think I brought up before, but I know I missed it the very first time it came up in episode two. On the graffiti wall behind Brad Wolf in that London alley, you can see the words written, all M are brothers. And in an interview, Dan Deliu hinted that fans are free to draw whatever meaning they want from that. So if we want to say there is a mutant brotherhood contingent in in London in 1977, we are apparently welcome. Detail number 13, I definitely pointed out the H.H. Holmes Hotel ad in the newspaper in episode three, as well as the insurance ad beneath it, but what I didn't mention is the history that serial killer H.H. Holmes actually took out life insurance policies on many of his victims. I mean, that was really considered his primary motivator for his killing spree in his murder hotel. He was both a grisly murderer and at the bottom of it, a money-driven con man. Okay, detail number 14, lastly, in the final episode, when Obi prints out the second editions of the TVA handbook, as he flips through one of them, you can see the page 
pages are blank. This could just be a production thing. Like they didn't bother to fill those pages out and they wanted Kiwi Kwan to just face it away from the camera, but we just happen to see some blank pages. But I love the idea that in this new TVA, employees are encouraged to write their own notes for ideas to make the operation better as a whole. To reference another famous lost episode, Tabula Rasa, the TVA is now a blank slate where these prisoners running the asylum are free to remake themselves. The best way to support new rock stars is to grab some merch at nerdriot.shop. You can follow me on all social platforms at EA Boss and subscribe to all three channels of the New Rock Stars Network. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye.